thank you for your patience. You know, we're live streaming to the entire world, okay? So I appreciate that you allowed us to fix up these mics for these fabulous people. Good evening, everyone. Welcome on this rainy Monday. It is fantastic to be here with you. My name is Christina Newman-Scott, and I'm the executive director of The Green Space. And he oh, there you go. I appreciate love that. Okay. So here at The Green Space, we channel the collective genius of New York City to create forward-looking art, theater, and journalism that sparks change. On behalf of everyone at the Center for Black Visual Culture and the Institute of African American Affairs at NYU and WNYC's The Green Space, thank you for being here tonight as we celebrate the publication of two books focusing on the Black Panther Party, Comrade Sisters, Woman of the Black Panther Party by Stephen Shames, and former Black Panther Party member Erica Huggins in a Time of Panthers, early photographs by Jeffrey Henson Scales featuring an introduction by our very own beloved moderator, Dr. Deborah Willis, uh, along with Waldo E. Martin Jr., who is, I'm not, is Waldo here in the audience? No? Okay, Waldo, how are you doing? I hope you're watching. <laughs> Waldo is the professor of history at the University of California, Berkeley. We're also pleased to have former Black Panther Party member, activist, and poet, Regina Jennings here to join in the conversation and celebration of this work. You're in for a treat because stay to get your books purchased and signed right after the conversation. It's gonna be fantastic. And without further ado, Please join me in welcoming, but don't clap yet, because I have to tell you about her. She's amazing. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Dr. Deborah Willis, director of the Center for Black Visual Culture at the Institute of African American Affairs at NYU, as well as university professor and chair of the Department of Photography and Imaging at NYU Tisch School for the Arts. So don't hook, hold on, one more thing. <laughs> I met her in the year 2000 when I was graduating art college and she was our visiting studio crit advisor in Kingston, Jamaica, not <laughs> Queens. <laughs> and it was remarkable because here is this extraordinary woman that walks into my life at the end of my very harrowing critique moment and gives me, you know what she did? She made me feel seen. In even a black country like Jamaica, I didn't feel seen as a black artist. Yeah. And when I met Miss Deborah Willis, I felt seen. And I remember saying to my parents, I'm an artist, I really am, because this woman saw me and all of the potential, and I've loved her ever since. We call her the fairy godmother of all <laughs> amazing artists. Now you can join me in welcoming Dr. <laughs> Deborah Willis. Thank you, Thank you Christina. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here, to see all of you, and to thank Christina and the Green Space, Jennifer, Kate, Amber, and all of the staff here at Green Space, and especially the DJ tonight. He set the tone for, <laughs> for tonight. Also, um, when I met Christina, I knew that she was going to make a difference in the arts. Um, who knew um, we would meet again here in New York City? But we met in Connecticut and Miami and different places. So I, I, I adopted her. I wanted her to stay in my life and wanted to have this conversation. When I, Jeffrey Scales called me up and told me about the book, and then Erica and Stephen contacted me about their project, I thought, wow, we need to do this together. And then also to call Christina and Joan and I. Joan is still here. So Joan is our <coughs> program director for CBBC, and Christina Santiago is is here as the program manager. So I'd like to take, thank uh, Clarissa, Sid, Emeka, and Kira, and also the New NYU Bookstore for their support, and also Terrence Jennings here is documenting. We're also co-sponsored um, through the Department of Photography and Imaging, 370 J Street, the Center for Media, Culture, and, and History at NYU. But also with the Office of global inclusion. It's really wonderful to have the support from Lisa Coleman and her staff, as well as the Center for Study of Gender and Sexuality at NYU. Just to set a tone for, to let you know what's coming up in the future, please mark your calendars for November 16th. We will have a conversation with Lyle Ashton Harris, a, a photo um, teacher here at NYU, 
and Joshua Rashad uh, McFadden. And the two of them will talk about his new book, I Believe I'll Run On, and it's a fantastic story. We also have December 8th, a Thursday, we have a public lecture by Nadej Green. She's a critic and writer and artist in residence, an activist in residence this semester, and she is from Miami. But just to welcome you, I'm gonna give short bios. We will, they will talk about the book, but through Jeffrey Scales, he is an independent photographer. He's been in my life since 19 and 80 something, right? 87, something right? Something like that. He, um, I was working at the Schomburg Center at the time, working on a book called uh, Black Photographers, 1940 to 1988, so we met in 87. And he's living in Harlem, and he knew about my project, and I said, I need to have this man here in, in my book. I need to meet him. And we met, and we've been friends ever since. But he was 13 years old when he began, began, a, wow. began his interest in photography and photograph, photographing the Oakland Black Panthers. So he has a number of images we're gonna share here. Um, he's also an editor at the New York Times. His work will transform us to think about how important it is to keep an archive and his yes. story, his mother's story, his story, his parents together really share a connection. And I think what's really fascinating about this panel that their mentors here, their friends here, people who shared a lot and I, I'm really happy to be here with this experience. Um, Stephen James and Erica Huggins, um, comrade sisters, women of the Black Panther Party, <coughs> highlights a little known story and it's really um, an important story as it's someone from Philadelphia who also knew about the, the women in the party who were very, very rarely talked about um, during that time of when I was in Philly in, um, in the 1960s and 70s. Stephen is a photographer and he's always focused on social awareness and issues from civil rights movement to the Panther Party. We have been friends for a number of years through his monographs. Um, I teach them often in my classroom. And he is represented by a number of galleries, including Stephen Kasher and the gallery Esther Waterloff? Woodruff. Woodruff in Paris. Erica Huggins is an educator, Black Panther Party member, political um, prisoner, uh, former political prisoner, <laughs> human rights af ad advocate, and poet. Um, I met Michelle Obama today, so I'm still kind of nervous about all of that moment. It's still in my mind. <laughs> For 50 years, uh, Erica has used her life experience in serving service to the community. And just the ideas that she has presented in this book, but also what she's done in terms of retelling the story of the Black Panther Party in the Oakland Community School, it has really helped me see uh, Oakland in a broader sense. She managed the HIV AIDS volunteer and education programs from 1990 to 2004. Her bio is on our website. Regina Jennings has authored over 25 academic articles and six books. Her book, Malcolm X and the Poetics of Haki Matabudi, won an International Book Award. Currently, she is writing a poetry book with brief, brief essays tentatively titled Killers and Cutthroats, Blacks Fighting Back in a Race Defense. And finally, we have um, our new guest is Reverend Cheryl Dawson. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, I'm sorry, I don't have your full bio, but That's we will okay. tell That's your right. story as, you, as we walk through this experience. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to say thank you all for being here and offer um, my first chance to introduce um, our first speaker, Jeffrey Scales, who's gonna speak for 10 minutes. I'm, I'm really a good moderator, I check time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> we're gonna speak, he's gonna speak for 10 minutes and then, um, Stephen will also, and then we'll move forward to Erica and the rest of the panel. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks, thanks for coming. Uh, my book, it's, it's a curious story that, uh, uh, well, it begins when I was 11. My father gave me a Leica camera, and he also gave me and my older brother a box that had every issue of Life magazine from 1936 to 1964 in it. So I spent years going over those magazines. And then when I, uh, and then in 1967, 
uh, my parents wanted me to get out of the Bay Area because it was the summer of love in the Haight-Ashbury, and that's where all my <laughs> friends were. And they sent me to the Midwest to stay with my relatives, <laughs> which what they didn't quite realize is that also turned out to be the long, hot summer of 1967. And my relatives were in Detroit, Chicago, and all these places where there was a lot of civil unrest. And I came back uh, somewhat uh, radicalized. And when I came back, at some point, I met this guy here, Steve, who was around the Panthers. And he mentored me in many ways, taught me how to develop film in your kitchen sink and things like that, and you know, different yeah. places to stand. I'm not right. responsible for these pictures. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And, you know, I used to, uh, you know, follow him around or he'd call me and say, oh, there's this event. Uh, and there was uh, another photographer, Perkle Jones, who I also mm -hmm. would spend some time with. And, and that's one of the things that I think is important that people should really keep that tradition of mentorship going, particularly young people in their teens, mm -hmm. is, you know, if you're a teenager, try to find people that are really professional that are doing the things and just try to learn from them. And the same goes for the professionals, just you know, share that sort of information. Because it turned out to be a, you know, a life of photography. And I was photographing the party for about three years. And then I, uh, in 19, then I finished high school and I moved into television for a couple of years and then moved to LA. But the film, it got misplaced. I, and I hadn't seen it. Uh, I hadn't seen it since then, you know. And I thought the FBI had actually stolen it because we were under surveillance. My family was under surveillance by the FBI, or whatever government agencies. I said, "Well, you know, it's gone." And then in 2018, we were selling our family home, and they were emptied out a file cabinet. And my older brother and my stepfather said, "Well, we found a box of negatives that your mother had." put in the back of a file cabinet. Uh, we think they're probably yours. Uh, do you want us to send them to you? This was in 2018. I said, yeah, send that to me. <laughs> and I get this box, and it's like 40 rolls of film from 1967, 68, 69, 70. And I had not seen these pictures for almost 50 years. And it was just an amazing experience. And the fact that my mother had hidden them away or just put them in a safe place was really something special. And there were even pictures, some of the earliest pictures, when I was on that trip to the Midwest, my grandmother got me a Kodak Instamatic camera. And there's a few pictures in the book that were shot with the Instamatic camera. And it's just seeing this, this old film and just bringing back these memories has been just sort of a, a remarkable experience. And my parents, they were activists. I remember uh, there was a, an event in 1967 when St uh, Stokely Carmichael turned over the leadership of SNCC to H. Rap Brown. They had the ceremony and celebration at my family's home, which was this big grand party and all the you know sort of radical elite were there and it was really something special. And, uh, and so when I st started working with the Panthers, you know, Typically, you know, we would sell papers and do different things. And I remember uh, I was at the office one time, and you know, Bobby had said, "Well, you know, why don't you take some pictures for the paper?" And so, you know, I was—they were publishing the pictures now and then. And Eldridge Cleaver came in, and Bobby says, "Oh, Eldridge, this is Jeffrey. He's going to be Jeffrey Scales. He's going to be taking some pictures for the paper." And Eldridge says, "Is your father Emmett Scales?" I said, "Yeah." <laughs> He goes, you still live in that big house in the Berkeley Hills? I said, yeah, we do. Well, you tell him you have to have a book party for me there. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of months later, you know, we had that party, and it was, uh, that was really kind of a unique experience. But it was, it was, it was, you know, the leadership of the party, they were very generous, giving me access and encouraging me. I remember Bobby Seale used to always try to get me to sneak a camera into the trial. Because, well, you're a kid, they're not going to search you, <laughs> which was not the case. But as a lesson of what you might want to go to to get a photo, go that extra mile, that, that carried with me for so many years. But then, and then looking, you know, looking at, this, at this work after all that time has 
is it's it's curious, as the publisher of the book said. Well, this is kind of like a prequel to to your life, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. you know, and looking at it after having been an editor of photographs for the last twenty two years, or even longer than that, because I was at the LA Weekly in the in the nineteen seventies. Um, so it's been truly a unique and remarkable experience. And, you know, I thank Steve because he was, you know, he was with me during the riots, you know. He, I remember he, I kept asking him, should I get a gas mask? He goes, well, it's, they're good to have, but it's hard to take pictures with them. <laughs> <laughs> um, or, you know, should I get a telephoto? No, you're not close enough. If your pictures aren't good enough, you're not close enough. He goes, I didn't make that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, How did music affect the the images during that time period? Well, music was was always a part of life. I mean, that was it was you know one of the reasons that my parents sent me to the Midwest because they caught me climbing out the fourth floor window of our house trying to go see Jimi Hendrix at the Fillmore Auditorium, <laughs> and that's when they decided it was time to get out of town. Um, but the music was a huge part of the Bay Area. Yes. And yeah. uh, you know, uh, and my my father, in addition to you know his activism, he also was involved in the music industry. He worked at the Hungry Eye and managed the Kingston Trio for a while. And and uh, we used to have this group, the Heavenly Tones, used to rehearse at our house that Sly's sister was in, and and Tremaine Hawkins was in. Mm -hmm. So that was always a big factor in. It's been a big factor in my entire life, because after I dropped out of college, uh, well, dropped out of UCLA college, I went into the music business as a roadie and a tour manager, and I tour managed for Minnie Ripton and worked with a bunch of other people for many, many years. So that, you know, the music coming out of that area, out of that era, was so strong and so mm -hmm. impactful. I mean, it, you know, and it, it carries on to this day. My other question before we move to Stephen is fashion. As a young photographer photographing in the parks or on the steps, what attracted you to the dynamics of fashion and dress during that time? Well, the style of the party was amazing. I mean, that was just, you know, I, my, my only regret was, you know, I never had enough money to get a black leather jacket. Um, <laughs> You know, I was the, I was the uh, I, I had the, the Vietnam uh, Army jacket, <laughs> <laughs> or I had that tweed one, which you can see me in it in his book. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the uh, you know black berets, black leather, and black power it was just a, a remarkable visual statement, and the way the party would choreograph the members with that style is, you know. Uh, like if you look at how they would present outside the courthouse and at different events, it was uh, it was really remarkable, and and added that to the style of 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 Emery Douglas's illustration, the, the the visual statements that he was making. You know, he did a you know a couple of covers with. Uh, I mean, that, the Panther Paper was the first place that my work was ever published, and he would do collages with it on the cover. Um, and just the whole style was amazing. And what was also amazing is that is the Panthers gave me an entitlement to be a photographer that carried through my whole life. That's great. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to ask you about that cover image. That's did you select that for the cover or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, sometimes, you ask, ask. yeah, the reason why, because so many publishers, you know, we have a difficult time with having black women on the cover, and to see the power of that image is so fantastic. So I was just curious about how your editor felt about you just, you selected that, and yeah, that's yeah. great. No, I, I worked with, um, I worked with an editor um, in Germany, a, a, a woman, who actually had been a curator at, at the Metropolitan Museum and, and then went out on her own. And um, she agreed. I mean, I think Erica agreed also. I think um, 
But I, I mean, Erica's going to talk about how the book was produced, but just briefly, she really was in charge of the text, and I was kind of in charge of the, of the visuals, and I selected the pictures, and I worked with uh, Angela um, LeBlanc, who can, <laughs> right up there, who helped um, find some pictures. Um, you know, my archives at the University of Texas at Austin at the mm -hmm. Briscoe Center, and so Angela went there and actually scanned a whole bunch of contact sheets and sent them to me, and I found a number of images, a dozen or more, that I had never scanned before, mm -hmm. that we put in the book. And we also found a number of images that I had scanned but had never been published in, in, in other books. Mm -hmm. So this is really, this book really is a fresh look at, at the women of the Black Panther Party. Great. Um, but when I started, I was a student at Berkeley, and Berkeley was kind of a hotbed of uh, radicalism. It was kind of the center of, of the, anti, the student anti-war movement. Um, the Panthers were there all the time. Um, and I, I started working for the Berkeley Barb. One, one day, Max Shear, who was the editor of the Berkeley Barb, I w it was in the evening, and Jeffrey alluded to the, the s summer of love, but all, all these teenagers ran away to Haight-Ashbury and Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley, and the police would round them up and, and try and send them back home. And so they were like rounding up all these kids on Telegraph Avenue, and Max Shear saw I had a camera, and he said, hey, kid, you want to work for the barb? <laughs> <laughs> and so I went, took those pictures, and and started working for the Berkeley Barb. And then I also went by the, uh, the Panther office. And uh, the same as with Jeffrey, Bobby Seale really uh, uh, mentored me, became kind of like a older brother, dad, whatever. Um, really brought me into the community, brought me into the Panther Party. And um, as Jeffrey once said, he, he taught me black. I, I had my black studies with Professor Bobby Seal, who I guess was a, a good professor. And that really changed my life because it really, you know, I had been following in high school. I had actually even made one study trip down south during the Civil Rights Movement. And, and I, I actually met and um, had a chance to have a brief conversation with the Martin Luther King in 2000. I think it was 67 when he came to Berkeley and spoke. Um, but the Panthers were the ones who really were leading the movement back then, and, and uh, not just the black power movement, but they were also very active in, in politics, registering people to vote, and with the Peace and Freedom Party, and the anti-war movement, and basically all the movements that were going on at the time. And the Panthers were really one of the most, I guess I should show some pictures. The Panthers were also one of the most progressive organizations at the time in terms of women, um, in terms of the roles that women played within the party. The real genius of the Black Panther Party was their 10 points. And everybody knows the point about self-defense and, and police brutality. Um, where the Panthers, uh, with guns and law books, would trail the police. And by the way, that was legal in California back then. California was an open carry state until the Panthers started carrying guns. And then Ronald Reagan, remember him? <laughs> passed the strictest gun control law in the United States to stop the Panthers from carrying guns. So think about that hypocrisy. You know, when you listen to all these Second Amendment people talk about guns nowadays. It was the first and the last time the Republicans got on board with gun control. Well, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, um, and the, the, the other thing about the, the Black Panther Party were their programs. They had 64 community programs, which came from the community, and you'll hear more 
about the programs later. This is the medical program and the medical cadre. They were testing for sickle cell anemia, and that really goaded the government into doing something. Back then, nothing was being done. And even at Panther conferences where they would register people to vote, they did sickle cell testing. The interesting thing, any of you who have ever dealt with a, a nonprofit, a government organization, you know that they have their rules up here and you have to fit into their rule. You have to go to them, to their office, and fit into their rules, whatever they happen to be. The Panthers were the exact opposite. They were, bot they were truly bottom up. Their, their programs were programs that the community told them that they needed. For instance, in Winston-Salem, they started a free ambulance service because the ambulance wasn't coming. Um, in other places, in, in, in New York and Toledo and other places, they gave away free shoes and, and free coats because children didn't have coats and, and shoes to go to school in the winter. Um, you see the woman on, on, on the right is Norma, um, and she's in somebody's house doing TB testing. Again, the Panthers would go door to door. They would go to where the people were and, and meet their needs. There were no means tests. You didn't have to show them your income tax. You didn't <laughs> have to, you know, any of that stuff that you had to do with, with a lot of organizations. On the right is the free breakfast program, the most famous program that the Panthers ran. And again, this was before Lyndon Johnson made feeding children at school part of his war on poverty. The Panthers did it before the government, and Lyndon Johnson made it part of his war on poverty. And 20 states, including California, um, started feeding kids in school. Again, the breakfast program. And the other, the other thing about the programs is that they're easily replicable anywhere in the world. I'm stealing this from, from Erica. She said this at one of our other meetings. And, and, but it's true. It, anybody, any of us, you, me, Jeffrey, anybody can start a program if they, if they see a need in the community. And that's really, you know, th that's really revolutionary because if people are hungry and children mm -hmm. are hungry, they can't study, they can't learn what, you know, what kind of adults are they going to be if they can't exactly. learn in school? And we know all about the school to prison pipeline, mm -hmm. you know, that's been written ab uh, about all, all over the place. And feeding kids is, is one small way to stop that. There are other things, obviously, that need to be done also. And look at the faces. Just look at this kid's face. Just look at the joy, the love. The Panthers were motivated by love. And look at the picture on the right. If you read any of the government or some of the media things, the Panthers hated white people, really? Well, they made coalitions with white groups, with Latino groups, with Asian American groups, with Native Indian groups. They, they had coalitions even with a white group in Chicago, the Young Patriots, who had a Confederate flag <laughs> on the back of their jacket. And Fred Hampton started that. The, Fred Hampton started the Rainbow Coalition. And if you think about it, who did the government assassinate? Fred Hampton. Martin Luther King, when he stopped just talking about race, and, and you know, the New York Times ran an editorial kind of basically saying, stay in your lane. Right. Don't, you know, Martin Luther King got out of his lane. He started talking about poverty and the war in Vietnam and linking poverty to race. Um, Malcolm X got assassinated shortly after he came back from Mecca and decided that white people weren't devils anymore. So I want you to think, think about that. What Ku Klux Klan leaders ever been assassinated? Good point. You know? Good point. Um, 
10,000 bags of groceries uh, with a chicken in every bag. Um, nutritious food. Again, if uh, any of you who uh, in this audience who may have been a recipient of, of government food handouts would immediately know the difference. There was no government cheese in any of the panther, <laughs> in the panther bags. I love those women. That's my wife's favorite picture I have of panthers that I ever took. They're revolutionary women with their groceries who came to a conference. And the Panther School. Mm -hmm. um, the Panthers started a school for their children, and that later morphed into the um, school that uh, Erica was the director of, and you may hear more of that later, the Oakland Community School, which was a very innovative school. Um, um, educators came from all over the world to see what they were doing with the kids. And again, it was a school based on love for the children. There was no detention, none of this nonsense that you see. You know, there were no metal detectors, there were no police at the doors. Well, the police were probably outside, but they weren't, <laughs> they weren't invited by the school. <laughs> There's another picture of the school. Again, look at the, the love and the care. the free clothing program. This is in Toledo, Ohio. Registering to vote. We all know how important that is. And if it wasn't important, our, our, our friends uh, in, the, in the Republican Party wouldn't be trying so hard to disenfranchise so many people. So the Panthers understood that as early as 1968. They were registering people to vote, tens of thousands of people, and, and running candidates. Um, in a coalition with the Peace and Freedom Party, which uh, you know included um, whites and and you know it was a very diverse party. Political education class again, 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 again. It's very important. The Panthers read, they studied. You know, revolution isn't made out of, out of anger or hatred. It's made out of love and intelligence. That's Afini Shakur on the left, who's Tupac's mom. She was a panther in New York. Again, love, 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 love. It's an after-school program that the Panthers ran in Harlem on the right, and... and uh, the left is in Oakland and Defremery, Defremery Park. Bobby Hutton Park. It was renamed Bobby Hutton Park. This is the funeral of George Jackson. And anyone who doesn't know about George Jackson can ask us during the question period. But again, the honor guard, a man and a woman. The women weren't relegated to, to, to the back. They were right up there in, in front with, uh, with the men. It's Kathleen Cleaver, and that is the image that we cropped for the, um, for the cover. Kathleen was, a, was a married to Eldridge. I'm sure you hung out with Kathleen a lot. <laughs> Kathleen is, was in, is incredible, a very brilliant woman. And there's another brilliant woman on the left is <laughs> And on the right is a panther um, um, artist who's, um, who later had many back um, covers of the, of, of the papers, Asali. And um, she's still doing art. And this, we're very proud. I didn't realize it, but I found out on the book tour that um, Asali's pictures are in our book, and it's the first time her pictures have been published in a book. So we're very honored to have been able to um, not only show you a lot of the women that you've never heard of, you know, that the media has really overlooked, 
as is often the case. As all of you women in the audience know, women have been active since day one. But when history is, is written, they're often kind of, we they're, they're not in the books. In fact, when I was in grade school, I think it was fourth or fifth grade, I had a teacher you know, at his bulletin board and had famous uh, people's pictures, of course, all men. And he, he wrote, history, his story. And that was, you know, what they were teaching in the, in, in the 50s. Well, we're really proud that this is now her story. Yeah. The, Can the we have um, Erica in speak now? So we can yeah, we're forward. almost okay. done. I'll just go through That's Angela. Yeah. But, you know, you could flip Selling it the paper. Over, over the time because we're now in at the past the 10 That's minutes. okay. Erica can speak. Okay, thanks. But you can still flip while we're doing that. Well, that's, okay, I'm done. Erica. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. And thank you, Jeffrey. And thank you, Steve. And you wanted to know how, how we gathered together all these extraordinary women and put their voices in this book, their own words, pretty much unedited except to fit it into a small space. We, how did we do it? <laughs> With a lot of love, wouldn't you say? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> and, and again, Angela LeBlanc Ernest, uh, we couldn't have done it without her. Not a bit. Yeah, really. And wh why did we do it? What was the reason that we did this? Because not only are women overlooked when the histories are written, they are often relegated to a role if they are mentioned. So we didn't have a role in the Black Panther Party. We were it. And for the 64, like the men were, and for the 64 community survival programs, we were the coordinators and the sustainers of those programs. And in places where there were just offices, we coordinated the offices of the Black Panther Party, out of which all kinds of things happened. And one of the ways we can bring, if this is okay, Deborah, mm -hmm. one of the ways that we can bring Cheryl and Regina in is by asking you to recount one memorable moment. This is what we did. We, we got together on Zoom because what do you do in 2021-22? You can't bring to pe people together all from all over the world, which is where people were. And in various states, in various places, and stages of life as well. So we just asked them to come together to have a conversation, not an interview, a conversation. And each Zoom was a family reunion. Mm -hmm. It really, really was. It didn't matter if we knew each other decades ago or didn't. We all had this bond of comradeship. Did you know that that's what we called one another? Comrade that's sister, right. comrade brother. And it meant exactly sister or brother in struggle. That's right. The kind of struggle that you have to intend to be a part of because it was full of joy and love mm -hmm. and we were in danger all the, time. all the time. But you're one of you, either one of you, your memorable experience. Go ahead, sister. How's everybody doing? Good. It's really wonderful to be here. I, it's marvelous to be here. One of the things that uh, I wanted to say right off is that, and Erica doesn't know this, even though we've been talking, Erica doesn't know this. When I joined the party, um, I was around turning 17 and an absolute drug addict, absolutely. Um, I would wake up, you know, and I had to have my marijuana and then, you know, I had to have my speed so I can get through the day. And when I saw, thank goodness, there was an older sister who dragged me to a church 
She said, I want you to see this film. The film was Huey and Bobby patrolling the police. Now, I've already mentioned that I was heavy into to drugs, so I didn't like the police for many, many reasons. So when I saw these two brothers with guns and they were talking language I didn't even understand, but they were talking about patrolling the police, I was like, I'm leaving Philadelphia. <laughs> I'm gonna find these brothers. <laughs> I wanna be with them, <laughs> okay, I want a gun. So when I got, <laughs> I did, what can I say? Um, so I get, I get to Oakland and I'm gonna shorten this story because it's kind of long. Anyway, when I saw sisters like Erica Huggins, now we're around the same age. It's not, you know, like they were so much older and whatever, but she could speak and she was eloquent and she was beautiful, you know, like, like Kathleen Cleaver. And I was like, oh my God. God, I had never seen sisters like that. Mm. I grew up in South Philadelphia, you know, in a ghetto area, which I loved, by the way. But in any event, I never saw articulate black women. And they were talking about black power. And they, their hair was natural. <laughs> I was a blonde or redhead or whatever I could possibly be the role model image that those sisters gave us who had never seen black articulate women, strong women. Like, and, and I want you to know this, I didn't run up to Erica or Kathleen and, and say, oh my goodness, you're just marvelous. I, I, you know, I didn't even know how to speak at that time, but I knew that I wanted to be like those sisters. And I think that that is one of the most memorable moments that I had in the Black Panther Party, just looking at those sisters, trailing those sisters, listening to those sisters, watching those sisters. It gave me an image and a possibility of what I might be able to come, to become years later. Wow, beautiful. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh, my name, of course, is Cheryl Dawson, and I'm sitting here wondering which golden moment I should share with you. Which one? There are so many. Um, may I say that I grew up in Berkeley, uh, and I'm I'm an old girl, so I grew up in Berkeley when they used to call us colored girls. Wow. Okay. So at that time in Berkeley, colored girls could live in one part of the town; that we couldn't live really easily anywhere else. And so my experiences were framed always in black and white because mm -hmm. Berkeley was a college town, but the emphasis of the university was cut off from our community. And so I didn't even know that black people could go to the magical, ephemeral UC Berkeley until I was a grown woman. As you may understand, Many black families bear the brunt and the remnants of slavery in America. So my family, having escaped the South, had come to Berkeley and uh, my family was just having a hard time, put it this way. And so growing up in Berkeley at that time, growing up as a colored girl, as a dark-skinned colored girl, as a poor colored girl, as a colored girl with a broken family, there was much that I did not see. And oftentimes, I really didn't have a feeling of being worth anything or included in anything, or I couldn't figure out where I could ever fit or where I ever belong. 
it's necessary for me to tell you the truth because a story is no good without the truth. That's right. That's so right. I'm putting mm -hmm. mine before you for that reason. Because when I was in the party, it was the first time is the first time that I ever felt worth anything. Yes. It's the first time that I felt included. Mm -hmm. It's the first time that I, I can remember when the brother in the party, when one brother I was working with called me sister love. Okay. <laughs> he called me sister love. Now, I'm going to be shaking when I put my fingers up here, but I'm trying to tell you something. To be called, to be addressed thus, after having been excluded all of my life, to have a full-grown, handsome, beautiful brother. Yes, what they thought. Oh, my God. Oh, <laughs> oh, Lord, just make your heart go pow, pow. Take all your breath away. Make your knees weak. You know, and so what are these uh, uh, beautiful black brothers turn to me and say, Sister Love, why don't you uh, show me something, something, something? My heart took that in. It was like water on a hungry garden. That's right. Mm. Not a thirsty garden, a hungry garden. Mm. His words had deep meaning for me because I knew that he cared for me. Not, oh, maybe sex was in there somewhere, I'm sure it was. You were all <laughs> young. But that's not the issue that came forth. Right, the right. issue that was planted in my soul was that he saw me. Mm -hmm. That made me real for the first time. Be seen. That came from the Black Panther Party. So that's not something you would read about in the newspaper. No, that's right. That tenderness, that love, that companionship, that belonging, that knocked down, dragged out care for our community, care for our elders, care for our children. It can't be duplicated, it can't be replicated, except if you love the people that you serve. And I guess that's it for right now. Sure. Erica, this, I would like for you to a answer that question as well, your question, just to A what? Memorable it, moment? Well, a pivotal moment, if, if not. A pivotal moment. Mm -hmm. At, like Cheryl said, and, I, and uh, Regina didn't have to say it, but there were so many moments. Mm -hmm. I remembered one that Regina told, told us when we were putting together our stories. And it was so simple. And yeah. I remember many that Cheryl has told me, including packing up her little baby. Hers is the first story in the book, when you, when you get it <laughs> before we sign it. <laughs> um, of packing up her little baby and going together to the office knowing that she'd be followed by a plane car, probably the FBI. Yeah. A pivotal moment for me was recognizing that I needed to leave school and join the Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it was because I read about the Black Panther Party for self-defense. And the word self-defense translated for me the way we can serve our communities. Right. Because in the article I read in Ramparts Magazine, which no longer exists, I wish it did, Huey Newton was strapped to a hospital gurney with a bullet wound in his belly. And the article was talking about the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense as an organization that served all poor and oppressed people. It was pivotal for me. It was memorable because in my 18-year-old mind, by the way, party members were median age 19. And you know, Jeffrey was 13, 14. And you were how old? 17. I was old. I was 23. Oh my goodness, over the hill. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so, but I was 18, barely 18. And I read the article and John Huggins walked in this was 1967, and he read the article, and we didn't have any words except he said to me, mm. yeah, we'll, we should leave. I said, you'll go? He said, yes. And we drove across the country to free Huey. Mm -hmm. We didn't know Huey Newton, <laughs> but we knew we had to contribute something. 
And in the room where we were sitting, having tea earlier before the event began, we were remembering the kinds of people that were drawn to the Black Panther Party. Yeah. There was something very tremendous about each one of us. Mm -hmm. I say that without reserve. I don't care what happened as time went by or how life continued or ended for some. But that's the truth. That is the truth. Because we knew that there was a big something we as young people of color had to do. The other thing that about all of that pivot time for me was that I somehow knew that we would collaborate with people who weren't just black. Or that being black was not the criteria for the Black Panther Party, and it turned out to be true. Um, I didn't know all of the things that would come, including the assassination of John Huggins and Bunchy Carter at UCLA. I didn't know that was coming. But I do know that I, I made a promise to serve people, and that was the beginning. You know, what, what I, when I read your book and, and Jeffrey's book, I thought about language. You know, you, the Black Panther Party, created a new vocabulary for yes. all of us. Yes. And it's still going on today. So people are using concepts of, of the party. And, you know, there was a sense of hope mm -hmm. that you all explored um, within the identity of community. When, you know, I remember when the first time I heard Sister Love, the, the brightness. Yes. And I was in California. Oh. You know? And just that felt, you know, that sense of connection and what it meant for, you know, for me as a 18 year old, you know, getting, you know, your my first Afro, you know, and what it felt like at that time. And so when I think about how the Black Panther Party and the whole notion of women creating a new language of sisterhood and what did it mean to you um, to begin to set up the clinics, um, the health clinics, as well as the breakfast programs. You know, because I see men were feeding children. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, just looking at the photographs, what was happening mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. the women were not only in the kitchen cooking, mm -hmm. but they were also teaching in the classroom. So I was curious about how did you all feel about the children at that time? <laughs> the children. Share the story of how you felt in the van oh, that picked you up God. for the breakfast program. It was wonderful. It was, let, let me just say this too, um, to preface before we actually fed the children. My captain of the East Oakland branch of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, he, he had gotten a mandate, probably from Bobby Seale, that we were to start a breakfast for school children program. And so what my captain did was to gather us together. He picked out who he wanted to go um, to the grocery stores in Oakland, you know. And um, by this time, we couldn't openly carry. But he said, look, I want you to pretend that you have your gun in your pocket when we go to these grocery stores. So I was like, right on, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> so um, he took us, uh, maybe about six of us, no smiling, you know. He was the only one that would do the talking and we would go into these grocery stores and he'd ask for the manager and um, the manager would come out and he would, you know, introduce himself, give his name, and say he was captain of the East Oakland branch of the Black Panther Party, and we wanted to start a breakfast for school children program, and we needed food. So would uh, this manager, would you kindly, you know, donate food to the Black Panther Party for self-defense because you are making money off of the black community, and I know that you want to give something back to the black community. <laughs> So we standing behind him looking like, we will kill you if you don't, <laughs> you know? And so normally, the grocery managers would agree, you know? Um, so the breakfast for school children started. Lord have mercy. What we had to do, we had to wake up around five-ish 
in the morning between four and five o'clock in the four four okay in the morning because we had to get to the church to prepare the area you know and to cook the food and I just remember you know God the Panthers would come to my we call it a panther pad because it was a million people living in this apartment anyway um, there'd be a special knock on the door and we would know it was our captain, okay? And um, we would all come out, you know, take our place, and then we'd walk to the van. And the sky, I, I, I wrote about this, the sky was like orange, blue, yellow, black. You could kind of even still see some stars, you know, and I remember just taking all of that in. And then we would get into the van and, oh man, you know, I mean, I honestly felt like I was on a rocket ship. Don't, don't ask how, but I did. I mean, we would just move through space, okay? Then we would get to the church, and then we had to prepare, you know, the food, and like Erica and Cheryl were saying, it would be a brother's turn to cook or a sister's uh, turn to cook or whatever, you know? It was always like a joint venture between brothers and sisters. I didn't even think about that. I just, that was just a part of, you know, what we did. And so once we cooked the food and everything, uh, and we waited for the children to come in, we set the table. And when those children came in, I can't, it's almost like a feeling of being baptized or when you really discover there is a God. Or what, I mean, the love, was so overwhelming. I mean, those children came in, they were so happy to sit down. And then, you know, we would ask them, you know, what did you want? You know, we had sausages and eggs and grits and toast. And, and they would pick and choose. And, you know, they had milk and orange juice. And sometimes their parents came. And we knew that their parents were hungry as well. Mm -hmm. So we fed their parents as well. And we would then um, engage the children during the time, like when Huey was in lockdown, it would be, free Huey, free Huey, free Huey, you know, and this sort of thing. So that experience was one of the most memorable experiences of my life because I couldn't have said it then and I can say it now in retrospect, that exchange of giving love and receiving love and to do it for black people, <laughs> it, was, it was just, um, it was indescribable. I, I even hated for um, the breakfast to be over when the kids had to leave, you know, because it was, it, was, it was kind of an emptiness once they were gone. Then we, of course, had to clean the church and... Uh, we cleaned the church, I wrote this in one of my poems, we cleaned the church with a mop that we called Methuselah, because <laughs> those mops were so old and so raggedy. So we would, you know, let's get Methuselah on out there and clean, <laughs> you know. And once we cleaned the church with our Methuselahs, you know, then we would hit the avenue with Panther papers held at our hip to sell our papers. Wow. That was the way that an average uh, Black Panther Party morning and day began. Wow. Cheryl, you wanted to I do. add. I, you know, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm in church, and in church <laughs> I just bust out with what I'm getting ready to say. <laughs> so I just have to say, to, to go along with my darling sister, who I just met and I feel such a marvelous uh -huh. heavenly kinship with. This is the way it goes, people. This is the way it goes. So I want to say that the community gave us its most vulnerable. Yeah. The, the community turned over mm -hmm. their babies That's to right. us. Right. They let those little babies come out as soon as it was light, because of course we were there already from dark 30 getting ready for them. <laughs> and they let those little tender babies walk down the street, knock on a door, come into a house. The parents were nowhere around, but they knew that we love those children. Right. They knew that we would do nothing but bless their children with everything we had. 
So let me just tell you this. It's more to the story than the bacon and eggs, which that's a pretty big story because to some hungry little children, you come in and you get some grits and eggs and you're good to go. So for that, yes, and for the exchange that went along with that from us to the children, like she said, and from the children to us. So by the time they finished eating and it was time to wash their little faces, I would get a little cloth and wipe their little faces and of course put the standard Vaseline on it because that's all we had to, for ash protector. You know, we had to put that Vaseline on a little chocolate face. If you don't face. understand, just ask anybody sitting next to you who is black or brown. What ash protector is, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. So then you kiss that little forehead and you tell that little child, Go out and be the king or the queen That's that right. you were That's meant right. to be. Because we knew in our hearts they were entering a world that did not want them. So we created that space for them on a daily basis. Right. I'm not through. So wait. <laughs> They're most vulnerable. They're most vulnerable. We took the elders. We took care of the elders. That's right. The elders and the babies. On my block, I knew every elder by name. I knew their medication schedule. Oh. I knew who was visiting them. And when we sat down for our dinner at Panthers at night and we did our roll call, I could say, Miss Julie has not had her evening meds. Miss Betty's uh, son is coming home at 8 o'clock. Uh, Mr. Horace, he had meals on wheel today. He's all right. Uh, Miss June, she goes to the hospital for surgery, so I got to get there early tomorrow. This is the way we operated. Yeah. From the bottom up, That's right. love only. Mm -hmm. Just to follow up on the love, we only have about five minutes left oh. before the book signing. Oh, wow. um, lots of books out there. And, um, but when I think about when Regina said, weren't they fine? And when I think about the photographs that both of you, sh you know, shared with us, the beauty of this community that, that was across um, all of the states. What about romantic love? How did you all <laughs> focus on falling in love, falling out of love, and you know what? How many minutes did you say we have? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Well, Christina, how many minutes? We have probably about five minutes before we talk about that. But it's just curious that we, we always hear about community love, which really touches our heart. But we also know about that romantic love that happened, sometimes the first love um, that could happen yes. um, when you're a teenager. So when I think about the romantic love that you all shared with all of the beautiful, beautiful people there um, during that time, men and women, I was just curious about how you all felt about romantic love. How did you, how did you date? We called it revolutionary love. Oh, okay. <laughs> and the reason we named mm -hmm. it that, do you remember? Yes, ma'am. Yes. <laughs> and the reason we named it like that is because it didn't matter who we loved. Mm -hmm. The party didn't have restrictions on man or woman mm -hmm. in terms of love because we thought we were all going to die in the morning. Yes, yeah, we did. We did. Mm -hmm. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. So yes, what difference did. would that make mm -hmm. if you passed up yeah. love mm -hmm. and your life is not promised? Mm -hmm. And so we also, um, well, when I worked in HIV and AIDS, I, I said kind of a dark joke. Well, I'm really glad that that epidemic wasn't happening during the Black Panther Party. Mm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, because <laughs> it, I, it almost, it, what mattered was the love itself. And I know that we have a hard time disconnecting sex or lust and love. Mm -hmm. But we were so close and we were in such danger that, I mean, we talked about the breakfast program. We talked about the seniors program. We talked about the ambulance program in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. But ongoing on a continuous basis from the early morning until I, it didn't stop, I don't think. We were bugged and tapped and surveilled. And Threatened. we were stalked. Stalked. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, and we were pulled aside and yep. Yep. we were we could be threatened to be killed. Mm -hmm. So when we saw the comrade we had a friendship with, or in some, ace, in some instances, a relationship with, the only thing we could do was just love them even more. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope that doesn't sound too poetic. I really mean it. No, it's beautiful. I really mean it. So much, and, and 
I mean it because I did lose many beloveds yes. to the heinous FBI counterintelligence program. And one of them was John Huggins. But I think that I love Bunchy Carter um, yes, yes, in yes. a different way, but mm -hmm. just as much. He was like a big brother. I never had a big brother, mm -hmm. but he was like a big brother. To me. And he treated me like, like you said you felt, like yeah. royalty. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like royalty. And I didn't ask for it. Mm -hmm. um, it was just the way he was. And so I think it's, that's a beautiful question, it Deborah. Is. And we don't get asked about it a mm -hmm. lot. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's the truth, and it makes me think about also how um, Huey wrote about the women's movement and it was called the Gay Liberation Movement at the time. He wrote about this in 1970, how if we do not take care of women or take care of the needs of women, if we treat gay men and lesbian women like they're, because all the initials weren't there yet, as we now know, <laughs> um, like they're less than, we are not aiding any revolutionary action. Great. Do Thank you. Time? Do we um, have time for one more? One more. Mm -hmm. one more. Okay. I just wanted to add that um, I already shared that you know I had been a drug addict when I got to Oakland, and it was um, my section leader of uh, the East Oakland branch of the Black Panther Party who literally knew I had a problem because of course I was trying to mask it, you know, um, but it was hard not to look up and find where the dope houses were in Oakland. And um, so I'd even have my papers and I'd go to get my, you know, my joint. Anyway, uh, my section leader, who I later married, but anyway, at that time, he followed me. And it was, I was never so embarrassed when he dragged me and my papers out of this dope house. And at the time, Huey was in jail. And he said, don't you want to free Huey? Isn't that important to you? What are you, a pig? Who do you think you are? He just, it, it was horrible hearing that I was being a traitor to black people. And this, my section leader, he just went on and on and on with that then he punished me, he made me run like 20 times around the block, you know. And after I did that, I didn't want another joint. I didn't want any more speed. I didn't want any more red devils. I didn't want any other drug. All I wanted to do was to free Huey P. Newton from the possibility of the gas chamber. That was the kind of revolutionary black love that we had in the Black Panther Party. Great, thank you so much. I look forward to, you'll enjoy reading um, the book and the poetry, and the comments, and, and also looking at the visual stories. And it's great to see all of you here, and thank you for your support. Do you want to open up for like maybe five questions or? Any questions? Can we open up the lights um, for the auditorium? And then can we open up just a little bit so we can see who's yeah, getting hands? We can't see you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? If you have one, just shout out because we can't see you right now. Yes. Okay. So for, uh, hi. So you started your service so early in your lives. I want to know what you went on to do with your lives. Cheryl? Oh, thank you. So uh, what I did, and, and I didn't really realize this until later, until we began doing this work around the Black Panther Party, our dear friend um, Jill Christina Vest created a mural project in West Oakland, a mural project depicting the lives of the women in the Black Panther Party and a mini museum my son-in-law called me one day and said, Segra, my friend is doing a museum about the Black Panther Party. You need to, you need to meet her, about the women. And I, you know, I was busy. I told my son-in-law, 
I don't know what you're talking about because no one had ever mentioned the Black Panther women to me ever. Mm. And uh, he said, you need to call her. And so, and so I did, I called her, I found out about her work and that opened a plethora of memories for me, a plethora of memories for me. And I understood then that I had taken the seeds of that political education class that That's we used right. to have in right. the party, which I absolutely hated because <laughs> I was so sleepy and tired. And they would always say, stand up, <laughs> Dawson, stand up, Cheryl. And I would stand up. But the thing is, I received the most glorious, the most honest, the most useful political education uh, information than ever came to me after that in all my universities that I attended afterwards. They never gave me the full story right. that I did, right. that I had right, right then. Right. And so I took that information into the prison because people said, why are you going into the prison? You're going to work for the man. And I said, I'm going into the prison. I don't work, I'm not working for the man. I'm going into the prison because our people are there. That's right. Our women are stuck in the bottom of a cement cage, and there is no light and little hope. And as long as I'm breathing, I will see, I will do my best to see that they have both. That's what I took from the Black Panther Party with me, yes. to serve my people. And I will do that as long as I have breath yeah, and yeah. strength. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, here's, okay, and then we have a mic over here after, afterwards. Yes, hi, um, thank you for having this talk. Um, so I see a lot of groups and activists look into the Black Panther Party, the 10 tenants and, th and things of that nature. So I'll say what is one thing that you've learned and that would be very um, instrumental in the fight now, especially post 2020, and what is one message you would import to um, activists, the youth these days? Take care of yourselves. Plan a way to eat well, sleep well, and think well of yourself. Mm -hmm. We didn't really know how to do that, and we're doing it now. Partly, this book is a vehicle for that. Mm -hmm. The stories are not war stories in the book. They are uplifting and joyful, and often very touching. But take care of your body and your mind and your spirit. That's what we're made of. That's what led us to do what we did. And it's not selfish. Women are taught that when they take care of themselves, it's selfish. No, it's not. It's selfless. Sure. Because you're making certain that you're in it till as long as you have breath and strength, as you said. And I learned that as, a, as an incarcerated woman whose husband had been killed and whose baby was taken away. Yes. I taught myself to meditate. So if, if women and men on the inside can do that, and it's a very common thing for women and men to do that, unbidden by anything religious. I'm not talking about religion, nor do I have anything against it. I'm talking about the power inside us. There's infinite power inside us. And when it is connected with the power that is needed or to be reclaimed outside, it is momentous. This is what the government was afraid of. Yep. They were not afraid of this little ragtag group mm -hmm. of people. They had all the power that they needed, but they were afraid of the sense of power that we had. So I would encourage people to slow down at least on one day of the week and take care of themselves. Like a, you know, like a computer needs to be recharged, or the whatever device needs to have the reset button pushed. And I still don't always remember it. I'm not talking about this as if, you know, I absolutely have it all worked out. But begin somewhere, and I say that specifically for women because society tells women that they should take care of the children and the men. And so, thank you for that great question. Yeah, thank you. There's a, um, a mic for someone up here. There's someone had their hand up. Can, who has the mic? Right here. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I'm just 
oh, wow. I could listen for hours and hours and hours. Um, I, that was, you answered my original question, which was that the theme at the CBVC is about black rest and what that looks like. Um, and so I've had to pivot a little bit. Can, if maybe you all could connect that to how you, um, deal with grief and healing and rest and balance all of that in, on this long horizon of suffering and this long game, um, how did you or have you learned to move through rest and healing as it pertains to grief? Well, for me, um, really piggybacking off of uh, what Erica said, I meditate every day. The minute I wake up, I call on the universe. The minute that I, you know, uh, turn in, I again make a kind of a connection. And I do that because I really want to be healthy while I'm on this earth so that I can continue to help, in particular, black people. And I had noticed when I was going through school, because, you know, the Black Panther Party might be over in a sense that you can't go to, you know, a chapter right now. But I'm still a member of the Black Panther Party for self-defense. So I have to keep myself as, as fit as I possibly can. And I've taken in other people's children, uh, uh, people who, young people, because I, I teach, young people whose father was on death row, you know, um, and, and uh, in particular girls who were thrown out mm -hmm. of their homes, you know, for whatever reason, because I remember that experience, I had that experience. So, and I'm an elder now, so I, I really feel it is my job, actually, to make sure that I impart to young people in particular my perspective on life and the best ways that we could make it while we're on this earth, because we're still hated. Understand that, okay? I mean, some of your uh, uh, so-called thinkers, you know, Henry Kissinger, whatever, I forgot the name of the document, they want to depopulate the planet, okay? Bill Gates even talks about that now. So, you know, then that means that when the police even kill black people, even today, okay, many of them don't get any time, right? The killer of Trayvon Martin is sitting home drinking a soda. And all of us know that he shot that baby boy, he was 17. We all heard the uh, call. So, so that I don't just explode, I'm sure you can feel my fire, <laughs> I must meditate. And I, st I study with um, people that are online. I study with Joe Dispenza. I study with um, Edward Bruce Bynum. You know, he wrote a book called The Black uh, Consciousness. But in any event, I have found people that help me to lower the flames that I have because I know that my people are still under siege. So when Erica talks about med meditation, that, that's not, I, don't, I really don't want anybody in the audience to overlook that. It means a great deal to uh, still the mind, especially like you young people. We didn't have cell phones and Twitter and Internet. Instagram that, that I'm still trying to figure out. I mean, we, we didn't have those kind of distractions, which are also isolations. We had each other, you know, in a way that this young generation, you guys don't have that. So it, it is important, I think, to create community with people who have your values and um, your best interests at heart and to still the mind regularly. You'll even learn how to study better when you do that. I was just curious if Jeffrey and Stephen, if you had a response to Kira's question about about grief? Not just grief, that you spent a, a lifetime of making photographs and you just went through the archive. What did it feel like to go back into that difficult 
period, to go back to create another archive. That archive became alive again based on that struggle. So just in terms of what Kira just said about healing and well, in where, sorry, where are the where are the moments of care? I mean, it, it brought back a lot of memories of loss. I remember going through the pictures and situations because I remember I was close with Bunchy, who, who mm. he taught me about the importance of poetry. Yes. Oh, yes, yes I'm sure and he did. Me too. And just the oh. feelings you have, like, you know, when they were killed yes. that day was just profound. Yeah. Um, and so revisiting that, you know, it was it was a little bit painful, but the tenderness of those relationships really rose to the surface in those feelings. Um, and and just and there were many more people just sort of looking at the pictures and the people that were, were you know have been lost. Uh, it the 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 love that you all talked about transcends that loss to mm -hmm. a large degree yeah. mm -hmm. yes it does you know and it's and it's and the love is also a little charged by the loss that's right um and so that you know that's you know that's uh that is important to me and it, and it, and it's it's something that when i look at the pictures i see that and even so much as like kind of some of the the the, the loss of some of that idealism not all of it mm -hmm. right. but the but some of it because yeah. when i look mm -hmm. at like you know the original mission of the party in a, in addition to serve the people which is a, a one line you know all encompassing statement but the for self defense was to try to stop the police violence on black people right. and here we are 50 years later Yep, some has changed, some is not. Right. Mm. You know. Cheryl, you wanted to add? I do, just briefly. Mm -hmm. I'll be brief. I want to say that for myself, I, I have found that um, my physical activity, to keep my body strong, I, I, I want to be strong. I have a tribe. I have four children. I have 13 grandchildren. I, I am the matriarch. Mm. I want to be strong for them. And... Uh, as long as heaven is willing, then I'm putting in my two cents. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing is I walk a great deal. And then sometimes if I'm feeling really spiffy, I do some <laughs> jogging in there too a little bit just to say, oh, you're still going? Well, then just keep on going. So and, I do and that. And you have some mean dance moves. And, and, and the thing I love, that what I wanted to share with you all, is I dance my natural yes. heart out every chance I get. Yes, I don't yes. care where I am or what everybody else is doing. They could be sitting down having having lunch, if I hear that beat and I feel it, I'm up on my feet. Because for me, dancing is supreme love and it is supreme life. And that's what I do a lot of, supreme love and supreme life. That's how Fantastic. I take care of myself. Okay, well, thank you all. Thank you. Okay, we're ready to sign books now. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right.